I want to give you three sort of suggestions which will uh, help you in all kinds of questions of this category. What I love is that it's very easy to dream up new versions of questions in geometry because the limit is just your imagination. But there are some principles that are the same no matter what kind of shapes or figures you're combining. So here they come. The first overarching tip is these are max-min questions, right? So everything that you have ever learned about max-min applies. So, you know, when you think about, oh, I get a function, should I, use, should I use the first derivative or the second derivative to test the nature of this, whatever. All that, that big flow chart, all that kind of thing. Just remember your training, go back to everything you already knew about uh, max-min questions, and, and just remember that these questions are a subset of those, so everything still applies, okay? The second thing is, you know because it's, it's geometry, okay, diagrams are going to be involved, but I'm actually going to steal a, a suggestion I gave to you back from circle geometry, which is that often in circle geometry, you can't see everything on one diagram. It's too much a mess of lines and angles and all that kind of thing. And you have to, for example, if part of your proof is to prove two particular triangles are congruent, you're like, there's like 10 triangles here, which are the ones that matter? So you draw those two triangles you're after off on the side so you can clearly see which features match up. Multiple diagrams are especially useful in these questions as well because for the same reason, but uh, you'll get more than just circles, okay? So as you'll see in a minute, for this particular question, it's almost, I mean, for my brain, it's almost impossible to do without at least two diagrams. So draw, draw more than one if it helps you, okay? The last one is to just watch out with the pronumals that you get in a question. Um, when, when we first introduced algebra, we instantly made everything harder because you're like, all right, numbers, five plus three squared, I can simplify three squared, it's nine, and five plus nine, I can put that together, it's 14. So numbers all naturally work themselves out. But when you've got pronumerals in the mix, you know, a plus x squared, you can't do anything with that. It's a, that's as simple as it gets. And so this increases the complexity of what you have to deal with. A, a large proportion of the problems that, we, that students encounter with these questions are not problems at all with the concept. It's, it's problems of performance. Like you just get confused, you lose a minus sign. Underneath that, just that take care with this, is to distinguish, so this is like a, a, a sub point of this one, is to distinguish between constants and variables. The, the reason I've chosen this particular question is it's a perfect example where you get a whole bunch of pronumerals just thrown at you, you like all these different letters, some of them you, di you differentiate with respect to this, right? Because it makes sense because it varies, so there's change. But other of the pronumerals are just there as, as stand-ins. What we're trying to say is, you know what? Uh, what you're about to prove is true with, with a cone of any dimension, right? So it doesn't have to be height this and, and radius that. They just provide uh, H as the height and R as the radius. And you have to make sure you don't mix these two guys up, okay? So the very first thing we're going to do is, with question eight in front of you, uh, they do provide very nicely, they provide a diagram for you, and as you know, that's no excuse not to draw your own one, because as you draw it, you understand what's going on better. So the very first thing we're going to do is replicate, in some ways, this diagram and think about it as we go. So read with me, it says, a cylinder of height h and radius r is inscribed in a cone of, and then it tells you a few things about the cone, okay? So let's just make a quick note about the word inscribed because this happens, this comes up a lot. What are you? We all have a sense for the, um, the idea of something being inscribed in another. If you just quickly draw under here, for instance, um, the most common thing is you inscribe in circles, but you can inscribe one shape within any other kind. It looks like this. If I say I will inscribe a triangle within this circle, okay? Uh, this triangle is not inscribed. It's not inscribed, right? Even though it's inside, what makes it inscribed is that it's the largest version of this triangle that I can fit inside, right? When I say version, I mean it's similar to, okay? So for instance, while this is not inscribed, uh, let's see here. So. This triangle, which is similar, has all the same proportions and that kind of thing, uh, <laughs> even the weird curvy edges that are not meant to be curved, uh, this guy is inscribed, okay, because there's no, you can't make this any larger and still have it 
similar to the original triangle. Okay, so that's what inscribed means. So when you have a look at this, you can see this is the biggest cylinder of these particular proportions that you can jam inside this cone. If you were to make the cylinder any larger, it would break the cone. Okay, so before I even start to draw this, since there are two shapes, I'm going to draw this in two different colors. I'm going to do the cone in one color and I'm going to do the cylinder in another. So let's do that now and please make this big enough. Okay, let's have a look. What do you think? How does it look at the moment? Okay, you can see I've done a few things here. I've drawn it, yes, I've drawn it horrendously large, but um, you know, it's, it's better to have one too big than to have one too small, and then you're like, oh, I've gotta, I've gotta add stuff in here, and I, now I need to draw a new diagram uh, and repeat it. So I've got everything there. You'll notice I've color coded it as well. So my cone and everything that pertains to the cone is black. So I've got my cone, I've got the height of the cone, the radius of the cone, and then I've got my cylinder in blue and everything related to the cylinder, also blue. It has its own radius and its own height, which are somewhat independent of the cone. All right. Now, uh, we've begun here with our um, first diagram. I'm going to go straight to this last suggestion I made here to take care with these pronumerals. Read the question carefully and tell me what varies and what is constant. Any, any, any pointers? Have a look. The question itself tells you. Uh, tell me the constants first. What's fixed? The, now, you have to be very specific because I heard height and I heard radius, but I have two heights and two radius. So which one are we talking about? Okay, the cone is fixed. So over here, under the, you can even put the heading of constants somewhere in like the top right hand corner of your working, right? If you say constants, I'm going to say um, little r and little h. And just to clarify that for myself, I'm going to say cone, okay? So these do not change. So for example, you couldn't do something like, say, the derivative of the volume with respect to little r, because it's not changing. You, like, it's, there's no, there's, this is change in volume, change in little r, and it doesn't change. So that doesn't make sense, okay? So I'm trying to avoid errors here. A lot of students, they come up with expressions related to this, and they try and differentiate with respect to that. That implies what the, uh, what the variables are, right? What are the variables? Big R and big H, which are, of course, the cylinder. Now, I put both of those down because the question has told me. However, as you'll see, if, you, if you're having a look at the scaffold that they provide, um, R and H are not just, they're not completely independent, are they, right? If you change R, for instance, let's have a look. Look at the diagram for a second. If I made R smaller, so I'm making the cylinder thinner, right? In order for the cylinder to stay inscribed, right? If all I did was make it thinner and didn't change the height, it would not be inscribed anymore, would it? Right? Because uh, I make that narrower, you know, like, but I have more space to go. I could, I could increase, right? So if I do change the radius and make it smaller, what happens to the height of the cylinder? Yeah, it gets taller, doesn't it? It would go deeper inside the cone. In fact, the, um, the smaller capital R is, the closer capital H gets to little h. Does that make sense? If, if, there were, if it were possible to make a cylinder of zero radius, it would go right down the middle and both h's would be the same. Make sense? So that's why you can see part A says, use similar triangles to show that. And then there's a relationship between all four of these variables. Now look carefully. Before we embark on doing this, you have to ask the question of why. why. Why is this a thing? Because in another question, I might, if I wanted to make this question harder for you, I would simply take away the scaffold. Part C, find the maximum possible volume of the cylinder in terms of H and R. Part C is the real question, okay? A and B are just sort of to help you get there. So if I wanted to make this question harder, I would take away A as a clue. So now I'm gonna ask you, why is A helpful? Why, what is it getting us towards? What do you think? What advantage do I have once I have part A? Hmm. Interesting. Let me rewind for a second. Differentiation, right? Because we said this is just like everything we've ever seen before, right? Uh, a very common thing you've already been doing is say, for example, you've got the area of like a, a paddock, right? That, that's a common one. And you're, you're changing the length of the fences or something like that. Like so, 
Okay? So you differentiate one thing with respect to another. But of course you can only do that if you have the area, if you have the area solely as a function of a single variable, right? Like if it's a rectangular paddock and it's got a, um, a height and a width, uh, so you say, oh, area equals height times width. Well, you can't differentiate that because you've got, you got two things, right? Which, which you're differentiating with respect to. So you have to get it in terms of one variable, right? Now have a look again at part A. What they're asking you to do is get capital H, get this guy in terms of this guy, right? That's, that's the first step of um, solving equations by substitution. Once you've got that, you can get rid of capital H. You can replace it with stuff that's just in terms of R, okay? So they say use similar triangles. To do similar triangles, I'm going to go to suggestion number two. I'll pause for a minute and let you have a play with this first yourself without me telling you. What diagram could you put alongside this that would help you identify similar triangles? There aren't any triangles in my diagram at all right now. So you kind of have to find them first. I'm going to give you a couple of minutes to have a bit of a play around and see if you can find where the triangles are that will get you this relationship. Off you go, see what you find. <laughs> 